Last week, I shared how the life of a disciple is demanding. Yet despite its seemingly impossible nature, we have been given what we need to succeed. We have been given faith. Now, if part of our calling as disciples of Christ, as I suggested last week, is to invite, welcome, and encourage others to know the love of God as it is revealed in and through Jesus Christ, faith alone does not ensure our success. Just as a hammer and saw alone do not ensure that something gets built. Faith, like the hammer and saw, is a tool Having the right tools for the job is important because without them, our chances of lasting success get pretty slim. However, just having them is not enough. They need to be used. And used in a way that takes advantage of their properties. Now, we all know the properties of a hammer and saw, but faith? What are the properties of faith? If we were asked to describe faith in one word or even one sentence, I hazard to guess, looking around the room, we'd have a multitude of different answers. Largely because faith is often seen as something personal and experienced in different ways by each of us. In today's reading for Jeremiah, Faith was trusting that God would never, ever desert Israel. Even as they lived in captivity, God would be there among them. So that one day, Israel would once again feel God's presence. But until then, faith was the strength and encouragement they needed to live in community with one another and with their captors. In his letter to Timothy, Paul's faith is in God's ability to overcome our inadequacies. His proof? God raised Jesus from the dead. And he says this over and over in his letters. God that can offer life out of nothingness is a God that cannot be thwarted by our refusal to accept him or our inability, our, our inability to accept change, to, to be flexible. For Jesus, faith is described as a willingness to journey with God along a pathway, trusting that grace will one day be revealed along the way. One of the things these three images of faith all hold in common is that they each describe faith as a pursuit, a pursuit of something special. In these cases, relationship. Relationship with God, with their neighbors, and with one another. Today's readings also show that faith is not something passive. Instead, it is something that takes its form not in the words we profess, but in the actions we take. Whether it is in our seeking, our living, or our journey through life. Another way to look at this is if our success in life is measured by the depth of our relationship with God and one another, then just as the hammer and saw are used to build and strengthen a shelter, faith is used to build and deepen our relationships. Of course, the next logical question that comes out of this is, how? We all understand how a hammer and saw are used, but faith? That's a little different story. 
Last week I suggested that we use the strength and encouragement faith gives us to invite, welcome, and encourage others to know the love of God is revealed in and through Jesus Christ. To know a relationship with God. This week, we see that faith enables us to seek God where we may not find Him. To enjoy the first fruits of our growing awareness of God's presence in our midst. And the ability to set aside our fears and journey along a pathway we trust is taking us in the right direction. Here's our challenge. Just as swinging a hammer gets tiring over time, so too does using and living our faith. If we are to succeed when we reach that point of being tired, we have two options. We can either sit down and rest, or we can ask for help. Now, I don't know about you, but when I get tired and I need a rest, I have my favorite comfy recliner. And when I sit in that recliner, more often than not, I nod off. And when I wake up, I am not in the mood to jump right back into what I was doing before. In fact, it could take hours, days, much longer to get back to the project I was working on. Just ask my wife. That's all well and good when what we're doing isn't needed immediately. But when it is, we are find ourselves forced to get up and work to finish what we started. Granted, we may not do it with the same depth of enthusiasm we did when we first began, but we work to complete it. Knowing that we have this tendency, a really good friend would not let us sit in that comfy chair in the first place. Instead, they would bring us a glass of cold water for nourishment and refreshment and show us a different place to rest our tired bodies. A place that keeps in sight the project or the task before us. As we live out our faith, and when we get tired, we need a place to rest. Comfy chairs like the television, a really good book, maybe even gardening, are all the things that wait patiently for us to take a break. Quickly, they shift our focus from what we have been doing to allow us to settle in and zone out. That's all well and good. But what we really need is nourishment to refresh us and a place to rest that keeps the task before us at hand. Now maybe you've already surmised where I'm going with this, but just in case you haven't, let me make it clear talking about our worship. Think about it. When we come together for worship, each of us, worn out from the world's activities of the past week, come to receive nourishment we need in both word and sacrament, while at the same time never losing sight of the task for us. Now, if this were the only reason we came together for worship, my guess is we wouldn't come together very often, since we would only come when we are tired. But not everyone gets tired at the same rate, do they? Some get tired more often than others, some can, can stretch it a little bit. You know, some make it tired enough to be here each and every day. Others, you know, they admit they're tired maybe once or twice a year. Now using that logic, if we are not in need of rest, why else should we come to worship? 
Remember that other thing I said we need to do or can do when we reach that point of being tired? We ask for help. What better place to ask for help than here among friends and family? Granted, we may not always be able to give the depth or kind of help that is needed, but someone in our midst can. Can you guess what I'm talking about? I sure hope so. God. Jesus said that when two or three gather together in my name, he will be in the midst of them. He also said that when you can agree and ask something in my name, it will be given to you. And I just lost my place. So if we need help in using our faith to live into the world and do what Christ has asked of us, I think it's safe to say that he will give us the help that we need. Why? We heard that in last week's readings. That when we are in relationship with someone, and faith is what, by the way, gives us the opportunity, the ability to be in faith, in relationship with God through Christ, we are ready, willing, and able to help one another when a need for help is made known. There's another reason we gather for worship, and we can hear it in today's gospel reading. We do so to give thanks for the help we've received along the way. I mean, when we're working on a special project at home, don't we part way through, step back and look at it and go, yep, looking good. Or if we're working with someone, take a look at it and say, you know, thank you. I couldn't have gotten this far without you. Of course we do. We rejoice in our accomplishments and how far we've come. And as we do as part of our worship, worship reminds us that despite the success we see before us, unlike the projects we are at in our home, this project is never ending. We will never see the finished product we will never reach our destination in this life. And for some, that can be disheartening. But when we look around the room, what do we see? We see we're not alone. We have help if it's needed. We have someone to journey with us along the way. But what about those who are not yet in relationship with God through Christ. Those who live lives relying only on themselves. Or those who are wary about asking anyone for help. How do we help them to see that the relationships built and formed and deepened through worship can guide and strengthen and sustain them in some pretty remarkable ways. One of the obstacles we must overcome to do this is ensuring that the worship that we and they experience actually does what it's supposed to. When we worship, just because that's the way we've always done it as members of this community, or that worship is too difficult for someone to understand or to navigate, it doesn't build and deepen relationships. In fact, it inhibits them. So how can we make sure, here at Holy Spirit, that relationships take root and grow through our worship? That is part of what we will be discussing at the Hospitality and Worship Seminar slash workshop that we're going to hold in two weeks. That's Saturday the 22nd. As Christians, we know that it is through faith we know God's grace. And that it is through grace we come to know God. 
I invite you to join me on this journey as we begin to explore the ways in which we might help others to know this too. Amen.